Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Sunday Supplement. Coming up on today's show, it's five in a row for Liverpool in the Premier League after a comprehensive victory over Tottenham at Wembley yesterday lunchtime. Chelsea, though, they're threatening to be with them all the way after Maurizio Sarri challenges Eden Hazard to score 40 goals and Wilfred Zaha, he claims defenders, they're out to break his legs. He scored the winner for Crystal Palace at Huddersfield. Tackling hard but fair today. Matt Law, he's the football news correspondent with the Daily Telegraph. Natalie Shedra is the Premier League reporter for ESPN Brazil. And Dominic, Fy Dominic King, I keep saying that. Sorry, Dom. I knew I was going to do that. <laughs> Dominic King is the uh, Merseyside correspondent for the Daily Mail. Uh, apologies, Dom. Dom Firefield, of course, is a regular on this programme. Morning, guys. Good to see you as ever. Thanks for coming. Don't forget, uh, you can tweet the show at Sunday Sup. The best will appear on your screen over the next 90 minutes. Let's have a look at uh, some of the papers then, if I can get over my embarrassment. Uh, the Sunday Express. They're ready to rumble. This is Liverpool, five in a row. Uh, Jurgen Klopp yesterday hailing the prefer perfect Liverpool performance at Wembley. Stadium, late goal for Tottenham, but it wasn't enough. Liverpool winning 2 1. The power and the gory is the back page of the Sunday People this morning. Firmino on the score sheet, but he was substituted in the second half of that game. He is a doubt, possibly, for their Champions League tie against Paris Saint Germain at Anfield on Tuesday. The Suns goals pull out a good headline. This <coughs> Vaughan is temporary. Class is permanent, whereas Hugo Lloris certainly on the pitch when you need him most. Back page of the Sun. Hazard warning. Sarri challenges Eden Hazard to score 40 goals. If, if he does, you'd think Chelsea would go on to win the title. They're neck and neck with Liverpool. Great start to the season for them. Uh, the Sunday Times reflecting on Liverpool's victory, but also this Wayne Rooney. Jonathan Northcross been out to see Rooney in Washington. More on him a bit later. And Beckham with his new side into Miami. He wants to plot, or he's plotting a move for the Barcelona forward Lionel Messi. You would think towards the end of Messi's uh, career in Spain. Sam Wallace's column always a must read in the Telegraph. Uh, West Ham's shaky foundations. It's a big job for Pellegrini. Um, we'll get to chat about him a little bit later on. West Ham playing Everton today. Uh, Daniel Taylor's column in the Observer talking about Marco Silva, the tapper uppers. If they won't change their ways, uh, the penalty must be Premier League points. We'll talk about him in part five of today's uh, programme, the Sunday Mirror. A uh, deal to die for, Pablo Dybala in uh, Juventus. They want to swap him for Paul Pogba in January. That's Simon Mullock's story in the mirror this morning. And finally, the mail on Sunday. Uh, Ruse the boss, Oliver Holt has also been out to see Rooney. He pledges to follow Steven Gerrard and Frank Lampard into the managerial hot seat at the end of his career. That little story on Zaha, his fury um, protests yesterday after Palace's victory at Huddersfield. We'll talk about him as well later on. But first of all, Matt, we'll start at Wembley Stadium yesterday. Um, we were there, uh, Natty was there as well. Um, and a comprehensive, very, an important performance by Liverpool and a big win. Let's talk about the way that they approached that game because last season they lost... Mm. 4-1 at Wembley Stadium and Tottenham took them apart. This season, this year, very, very different though. It was and I, I think last season they were 2-0 they were down really early, weren't they? And, and they came out fast and dominant this season. I mean, they could have been a goal up inside the first minute. Yeah. Um, they took the game by the swift of the neck and, and sort of never let it go until the stoppage time, basically. I mean, I, I was just really impressed with, with how... It reminded me a bit of, do you remember last season when Manchester City went to Stamford Bridge and, and went against Chelsea mm -hmm. and, and just dominated the whole game? Yeah. And the performance reminded me a little bit of that. To actually go um, to Tottenham and not just win, but just take the game to them and, you know, force Tottenham to try and change formation in the game. It didn't really work for them. They just dominated the whole game and it was so impressive because of that. Yeah, it was impressive. Do you detect... A different Liverpool, this bounce from perhaps reaching the Champions League final last season against Real Madrid, that that's given the confidence to go on and excel in the Premier League? Uh, of course, Liverpool signed, spent a lot during mm. the summer, but we have players that are doing so much better this season. Not that they weren't doing well last season, but Joe Gomez, you have Wijnaldum, that's the main midfielder today for, for Liverpool. And even uh, Mane. Mane did a very good season two, week, two seasons ago, mm -hmm. and last season he wasn't as good as he can be, and now he's just in the top of his game. So you have this, and Liverpool seems to find the space of game, and when they get to this space, it's very hard to keep up. So it's, it's impressive. Yeah. Am I forgiven? 
course you are. You're always forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what's different. What's changed? What's changed <clears throat> under Klopp this season? Well, the thing that they're benefiting from at the minute is um, the team the, or the engine, the midfield. None of them went to the World Cup. Three of the four defenders, I think, never went to the World Cup. So they've all had a proper pre-season, proper rest, proper preparation. Um, and the lads who've come back from the World Cup are, are a level below. So th they've had the perfect clock preparation um, and they've come out of the blocks flying. Mm. Um, I think they know now as well that, I mean, when we were growing up, you kind of uh, expected title winners to win it around Easter. There was always that period around Easter when you, the title winners used to pull away. I think in recent years, the title gets won in September, October, with the, you know, peak the Leicester, Chelsea with Mourinho, Pep last year, win after win after win. And if you know if you lose ground, you can't you can't make it up on these teams. So Liverpool needed to do that. Had a really good um, the preparation in America when they went um, to do the training camp. Everything went perfectly, and it's just gone into the season. Yeah, it has gone into the season. The investment in the summer, Dom, was that designed to keep Liverpool in the top four, or was it designed to go and win the title? No, they've gone for it. They've, they've, they, <coughs> it's, it's all very well going out and strengthening the squad with a, say, a £20 million player here, £25 million there. They, they needed a, a goalkeeper, absolutely needed a goalkeeper. They've gone out and gone the back, got one of the best in the business. Um, he wanted Naby Keita from 18 months ago. Um, they paid 50 million to get him off the market last year. It was essential that they got him because he's, you can see the difference that he's added with um, the way he can run with it, the, the passes that he sees, the energy that he's got. Uh, he was essential. Um, Fabinho, he's had a difficult start in terms of getting adjusted, but Liverpool could end up playing 65 games this year and he, he's going to play a part. And then this, the business for Shakiri for the price that they paid for him was was a steal really mm -hmm. you know he's come in and he's added depth um, because that was the one thing towards the end of last season was they just didn't have depth and you've seen that in the the Champions League final when they couldn't um, make changes mm -hmm. is Alisson an obvious upgrade in, in goal for Liverpool and you talked to us about his evolution as a goalkeeper because the yeah. demands from Klopp this mm -hmm. kind of sweeper keeper idea that is an obsession now in, well, not only in the Premier League, but in, world, in certainly top-level world football, Natalie. Has he had to change his game down the years? Uh, he matured a lot, and especially in his final year at Roma. Uh, Brazilians were a little bit suspicious at first when he started to being, uh, being called up for the national team because he, he didn't play so much for Roma. And his last uh, season was brilliant and he's he has this presence in the pitch that just gives the players a sense of security you know and that's i think that's very impressive although the fact uh, uh moreover he's he's very good technically and he plays really well with his feet but above it all he's a great goalkeeper i did an interview with klopp during this season and he was highly impressed he was like what a goalkeeper Alisson is. So it's nice to see him uh, having such an impact uh, as soon as he got uh, to Liverpool. Yeah. But has, he, has he changed in this, the idea that you know, he's been, the demand to play with his feet, to play out from the back? I mean, yesterday, there was, there was a couple of times yesterday where he, he drilled balls out. Um, I think Trent Alexander-Arnold, one had sailed straight over his head, mm -hmm. a, a, an angled ball. And it didn't seem, we'd, it, it didn't seem that it was, it was entirely sure what he was being asked to do in certain in certain situations. Yeah, I think after what happened at Leicester, maybe he will yeah. choose more the moments that he will use his feet, but he will definitely keep using his feet because it's a big asset for him and he does it really well. And uh, I, I don't think he, he changed. He, he evolved in this, in this aspect during the years. And I think he's, he's in a very good level today. That's, that's the... The thing um, Natalie said about his passing, that's, it struck the players straight away. You know in the first, the first couple of training sessions that they were with him, <coughs> it's the quality of the ball that he was putting out to them, it was like drilled. Um, and he's also added this sort of um, security, confidence. They, they, they know that what's behind them now is basically unflappable. I'm not sure that the, the level of trust was there with Carrius last year. Um, Obviously, what happened in the, the Champions League final happened. Um, 
he's just a, a, a massive upgrade. And, and the players know they, they, they've, there's a different level of trust with, with him and with Van Dijk that they, they can then uh, concentrate on the attack, knowing that what's behind them is, is the best. He's got some, they've got some security behind them. Matt, um, every time we see Jurgen Klopp, we try and tease it out of him that this is the year, mm. the challenge, the challenge um, to win the Premier League title. But he's very, very reluctant to get involved in that. Is, no, that, it, is that a deliberate strategy for him? Because he's, he's in charge of a huge club, the demands are obvious, the investment is obvious, the way the team is playing, that everyone's enjoying uh, watching them play. Mm. But he's refusing to get carried away. It's just sensible, isn't it? I mean, we're, mm. we're five games in, and I, I actually agree with Dom that quite often these days the, the league either gets won or you, you know the two teams are going for the league in sort of late September, early October. Mm. But it'd be crazy for a manager to get drawn into to talking about the title after, after five games. They'd just be setting themselves up for a fall. I mean, Liverpool's recruitment has been sensational over the last sort of 18 months. And, you know, when, when Manchester City won the title, their recruitment had been the best. When Chelsea won the title before that, their recruitment had been the best. And it looks to me at the moment, Liverpool looked like the only club in the summer and going back the previous January, because obviously they got some deals kind of sorted then, who've actually got what they wanted and what they needed in the end. Yeah. Um, whereas I think most clubs suffered a really difficult transfer window. Even Manchester City, who, who, you know, they wanted Jorginho, they didn't get him and they didn't end up getting that player at all in the end. So I think that is a huge, huge bonus for Liverpool, that they're the one club who have got exactly what they needed and what they wanted. Yeah. Uh, what's impressed me, Natalie, is that they, every single type of challenge that they face this season, West Ham opening weekend of the season, OK, their new signings, let's see what you can do. They go and they put them away 4-0. Pellegrini, of course, in charge of his first game. Then it's on to Crystal, Crystal Palace, Palace, the intensity, the volatile atmosphere. Can they deal with that? Yes, they can. They go and win again. Brighton at home, OK, wasn't a great performance, but they held on. To win, to win that game. Yesterday, they go to Tottenham and put in a, a level of performance that we certainly perhaps hadn't seen from them in previous years, certainly when we compare it with the Tottenham game last season. So they're just every type of challenge, they deal with them. They've got, they seem to have solutions everywhere on the pitch. They're efficient. They're not always brilliant. If mm. you saw Crystal Palace, you know that. If you saw the Brighton match as well. But they're efficient. They know, they know how to search for alternatives and they have this uh, identity that's so strong at this point that they just they just find solutions it's it's impressive in this sense yeah. I think that the two challenges for Klopp is going to be a the Champions League starting and, and combining that and you see with the teams how they manage that as to whether that's going to help them to win the title and then secondly I think over the course of the season they've got such a big squad and such depth now can he keep them all happy They'll all be happy now. It's early in the season and mm. the sunshine and it all feels great and players will accept that they've been to the World Cup so they'll sit on the bench a bit more. But, you know, come January, February, can he keep all those players happy, which, which Guardiola managed to do at City mm. and Klopp will have to do at Liverpool too. That, that's a good point, Matt. Jordan Henderson, one of those players. Yeah. Cap captain of yeah. the club. You mentioned right at the start and, it, and it's perhaps a point that we overlook at times is... The World Cup effect. Yeah, it's the guy who went to the World Cup. Yeah, well, it's um, it was del deliberate yesterday. Um, he's looking after uh, Jordan. Jordan knows he's not at the level that he, he needs to be at the minute. Um, he knows that. Yeah, he knows it. Well, he's he came back to training on August the fifth. Um, so if you try and equate that, he'd basically just be ready for his his, his first game of the season. He's, he's miles behind them, and he knows that himself. Um, I think he could probably play against Paris Saint-Germain on Tuesday night. Um, but at the minute, um, he's looking after them. And I think it's going to be noticeable with the Tottenham lads as well, the, who've been away with England. They've, they've had a, a huge sort of demand on them through the summer and then not being able to condition themselves in the way that they would, you know, the, the tapered games all the way through the season. So they're going to have to look after them at this stage of the season. So they'll be effective uh, come later on. But, I mean, I know people sort of raised eyebrows about why the captain's not in the in the team for a game of that magnitude but <coughs> it was it's a deliberate deliberate plan um, to look after him. Okay. So can they make it stick? Five wins in a row. They're up there with Chelsea. May as well give us it now. Give them give them <laughs> give them it now. Us. Uh, no, it, <laughs> giving it all away. No, 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 no. Well on this show. Um, <laughs> no, listen, they've given themselves um, they've given themselves a great platform but 
I remember when Liverpool won five games at the start of the season in 1991 and finished, I think it was about 10 or 11 points behind Arsenal. There's a long, long way to go. Anything, anything can happen. Yeah. All I would say is they're going to be right in the mix. Yeah, in the mix. We thought Tottenham would be in the mix. But what's happened to them? Brilliant yeah. victory. We're, one, of the, one of the milestones of the season was clearly the 3-0 victory at Manchester United. Yeah. And then they played Watford. I spoke with uh, Pochettino after the match yesterday and uh, I asked him about this gap, uh, how, f how far Liverpool is compared to Tottenham and he spoke mainly about the, the physical aspect that uh, Liverpool and Chelsea are ahead because of their preseason and because they didn't have as many players uh, until the end of the World Cup. But it's not only that, y you, yesterday if you saw the match you didn't see uh, a team that lost because of physical conditions. You see, you saw a team that was kind of dominated, mm -hmm. even though they had possession, because they had 60% of possession. So it's, I, I don't know, I, I see Tottenham uh, fighting for the top four, but not, they, they are not in the same level. They, they've, they've got seven players, haven't they, who went to the semi-finals or further yeah. of the World Cup. Mm. And looking at them yesterday, I don't think it's just a physical thing with that. I think there's a mental mm. fatigue within that as well because they were so sloppy. I mean, like you say, they had a lot of the ball and a lot of possession, and yet they were really sloppy in possession. The amount of time mm. they actually played Liverpool through themselves, you know, yeah. Dyer did it, yeah. Toby Aldevaro did it, Moussa Dembele did it, um, and it looked almost like it was almost a mental thing as much as a, a, a physical thing with them. And I do think that that squad is is really, really stretched at the moment. They can't afford to leave people out like Liverpool can Matt, with is it, Jordan is it, Henderson. Is it, is it fragile? Because after the Watford game, Pochettino had every right, certainly, to be critical with his side. Whether, OK, he did it publicly, mm. but it was very obvious that privately he could, have, he could have done that too because the performance wasn't acceptable for a side that's just beaten Manchester United 3-0. Yesterday was very different, though. His, he, he took a completely different approach mm. to the way that his side performed. And a lot of people who were at that game yesterday said, well, this is the same as Watford, only different opponents. Yeah, I mean, he said it was nothing to do with attitudes yesterday, didn't he? Whereas with Watford, he was, he was very harsh on them because he felt the attitude wasn't right. I mean, what struck me this season, I went and did his press conference after, his first press conference after the, the Man United game, and we all went up expecting it to be buoyant and really kind of celebratory. Mm. And he battered the team. He came in in a terrible mood and he absolutely battered the team and players. And he said, his, his exact words were, if we keep playing like that, we will crash. And it's felt like he knows, he must be seeing it on the training pitch. He must see that they're, they're not at their normal level at the moment. And even when the results were going well in the first few weeks of the season, he felt that the results were, were masking the reality mm. and that the reality is now that what we're seeing. Um, but he does have to be careful, he can't question their attitudes. He's got to work with this same group of players all season. They play on Tuesday, a tough, tough match in Milan. Mm. So he can't just keep battering their attitudes, I suppose. But, I mean, they keep conceding offset plays. They don't seem to be able to sort that out. The sloppiness within the game has been there. Or, or the, it's the same mistakes at the moment that, mm. that, for some reason, they can't sort them out. And Harry Kane as well, up front. I mean, he looked, he looked, he just looks tired. But no one, no one wants to give him a break. OK, Gareth Southgate put him on the substitutes bench against Switzerland, but did call on him eventually on uh, the Tuesday at the King Power. Apparently, not even Harry Kane wants to give Harry Kane a break. <laughs> because, yeah, yeah yesterday uh, after the, the match, he said that he wasn't tired at all. And, uh, well, when you're a striker, people always have to find a reason. But if you, uh, if you score uh, two matches in a row, people just... Uh, stop uh, saying anything about your game and he was asked okay in a perfect word would you like some rest and he said absolutely not I quote yeah. so he always wants I mean when he's yeah. injured he always rushes himself back he to does. play he yes. did that last season when he yeah. wanted the golden boot didn't yeah. he when perhaps he could do it a bit more possibly I mean that you know people at Tottenham will tell you that he is being rested that he's not partaking in every training session that they're trying to manage him through weeks um, not seeing him every day, I find it a difficult one to judge. But Harry Kane is, is really one of the, the worst players, is, is the wrong way to put it, but one of those players who will put pressure on the manager to, to play him every single week, whether he's injured, whether he's 100% yeah. fit. And it's, it's a good thing a lot of the time. Yeah.
Good attitude, yeah, yeah. But he's struggling for goals and struggling for a little bit of form at the moment. OK, uh, next up, we're going to talk about Chelsea. Their five wins on the spin as well after yesterday's demolition of Cardiff. Cardiff, Eden Hazard with a hat-trick. Can he get 40? Sarri seems to think so. More on him next. Welcome back. Um, we should give due prominence to... Uh, this lot, Chelsea. Uh, big win for them yesterday, 4-1 uh, against Cardiff at Stamford Bridge. Eden Hazard with a hat-trick, Matt. Um, an impressive start to the season, but it seems like Chelsea, are, this is all under radar, that all the talk and the hysteria and the hype is about, has, been, has been about Liverpool so far. Yeah. But Chelsea are doing a very, very good job with any coach. Yeah, I think he's, he's only the, the fourth or fifth manager to come into the Premier League and, and win his first five games. I mean, they haven't... They haven't really played anyone that you would that you would say, oh, there's proof that they're, they're going to be genuine title contenders, um, albeit Bournemouth are a good side and they, they put Bournemouth away in the end. So, <laughs> But it's, it's been a perfect start for him and he's got Hazard firing with which Chelsea, with Chelsea. If you get Hazard firing, you've, you've always got a chance, mm. basically. I mean, his, his numbers at the moment are ridiculous. With Belgium, I think in 27 games, it's 14 goals, 14 assists. Mm. And that, you know that's kind of Messi, Ronaldo, mm -hmm. level of numbers, and now it's it's five goals for Chelsea already. I think it's it's about as many assists as well. Mm. Um, he's just really influencing matches. He's taking over games. He's he's stepped up a level both for Belgium and now for Chelsea. It looks like. Yeah, he is Chelsea's undoubtedly their best player. They managed to keep hold of him in the summer, Natalie. How crucial is he to their ambitions of winning the title? You know, what caught my attention about Hazard is that you might imagine that he wouldn't be as motivated mm. after all the speculation during, during yeah. the, the summer transfer, if he's going to Real Madrid, if he's not going, and he's highly motivated. <laughs> Motivation is not a problem for him. And the thing that I really like about Sahi is how demanding he is, because after the match, when, when he gave the interview, he was very serious. He was like, you just won for new. Hazard was scored a hat trick, and he praised Hazard. Obviously, he said he can be uh, the best player in the world, but he said, uh, but he needs to put his energy in the last 25 meters of the, the pitch. You know, he's always uh, looking for adjustments, even on Hazard. And he said that we are far behind uh, City and Liverpool. So it's going to be interesting to see Chelsea's development and Chelsea facing these two teams because I think uh, I think it's going to be it's going to be good between these three, yeah. He is undoubtedly their talismanic uh, presence and, and their force on in terms of the Premier League greats where is 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 Hazard right up there? Oh yeah. Yeah, he's a Certainly in the in, in in ten years time when we're tripping him off the time when we're saying Zola, Bergkamp, Henri, will in the same sentence will we <clears> say Hazard? I don't know whether he's you've you've just named three absolute giants. Um I don't want to sort of disparage him. Uh he's just a brilliant player. Uh, I just love watching him when he's I, I remember seeing him um play for um Lille against St Etienne. Uh, it was Joe Cole's first game, seven years, I think it's almost seven years ago this weekend. And he scored a goal and it was like it was like a PlayStation goal mm. where he started and he beat one and beat two and he comes in and then and he scored and I spoke to Joe afterwards and he was saying this this kid's gonna be absolutely brilliant. Went back at the end of the season for his final game um, and he scored a hat trick and it was it was just before he joined Chelsea. Um, and he's basically done Everything that everybody said he was, he's, he's been he's been brilliant for five years, and if he make no mistake, they're right in the mix for the for the title with mm. the, the midfield that they've got with you know Kovacic and Kante and Jorginho, and if he's if he's on fire, then they they're right in there, don't when, no doubt about it. When you talk about his character, Chelsea are really lucky with him. I mean, when he signed his yeah. last contract with Chelsea, he doesn't have an agent. He drove himself in to mm. the training ground on the day to go and sign at the time the biggest contract of his his life. No one was with him. I think maybe he had a lawyer with him uh, just to check it all over. But there's no airs and braces about him. the old Gary Neville Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> you go into Sir Alex Ferguson's office, he says, That's it. you've got a contract, and it's 500 quid a week, sign here. Sign here. here. Mm -hmm. And there's no airs or graces about yeah. him. He's, I mean, all, all footballers say they are, but he really is a family man. If his family's happy, yeah. he's happy. Chelsea, 
I remember when he gave that interview after Belgium beat England and he said about, you know, basically I want to go to Real Madrid. Chelsea never really had any worries about him. They were always categoric, mm. we're not going to sell him and we know he's not going to kick off. We're absolutely relaxed about the fact he will be fine. We're not going to suffer any problems. He's not going to be like Courtois, who went AWOL in the end to get his move to Real Madrid over the line. He's not going to sulk, we know that. He'll be absolutely fine. There was, there was really no, no panic at Chelsea, and it just told you everything about him yeah. as a lad and a character. And if he ends up, you know, whether or not the Real Madrid thing has gone now, whether it comes back, if he ends up now pretty much staying at Chelsea for the rest of his career, I actually think he'll be perfectly happy. As long as he's playing in a team that allows him to be free and allows him to score, yeah. I think he'll yeah. be happy. And that was a, a problem at the end with Conte there because he didn't feel free. And there was a real big fear at Chelsea that if Conte had stayed, that would be when Hazard looked to go. And it wouldn't have been about going to a bigger club, it would have been about his own happiness. And he's got the smile back now. Has he got the drive and the desire to be the very best? Sarri wants him to be, believes he can be, that he thinks he's right up there as things stand, certainly on form. But has he got the drive to do it? I think he does, absolutely. And I think uh, there are two factors that really helped Hazard in this start of the season. He is obviously more confident after, World, after the World Cup because he did so well. And the way Sahi plays really benefits him because Sahi has these very simple ideas of football that in, in, on the pitch they are very hard to execute. But it's simple things such as uh, once uh, I was interviewing Jorginho and he said, uh, Sahi says that uh, we can't lose the ball because if we lose the ball, we spend energy trying to get the ball back. So we have to keep the ball. It's a simple idea, yeah. but it's, it's hard to execute. And, and the players love it. Everybody bought it. Everybody bought this idea. And I think it's really benefiting Hazard. Uh, in contrary of what happened last season, of him playing kind of in an isolated way, and mm -hmm. he, he didn't like it that much. So, yeah, that really helps him. The, the striking difference here, guys, is Hazard came off the back of a successful World Cup and went deep third and fourth place playoff with England. Mm. He's come back scoring goals for fun, enjoying himself, lots of energy, smile on his face. And yet we're talking about Harry Kane. But he was rested. Henderson. Oh, he's tired. He was rested the first three games. He, mm. he was on the yeah. bench for the first three games. OK, he came off the bench. Mm. Yes. But they, they did manage him. And, you know, whereas Tottenham can't leave a, or don't feel like they can mm. leave a Harry Kane on the bench, even if you're thinking you'll bring him on mm. for 20 minutes, half an hour, Chelsea did the first three games. And yeah. he was brilliant when he... When he came yeah, on. Those yeah. little cameos, he came yeah, on, he was, yeah, he enjoyed himself, didn't he? Uh, Chelsea-Liverpool, they've got some big games coming up against each other. What, how do the managers um, approach, approach those games? <clears throat> at the minute. Because um, at the moment they're on collision course yeah, to be... At the minute. ...potentially 100% records yeah, going into those fixtures. At the minute, um, Jürgen Klopp won't even be given any thought to it. First thing will be Paris Saint-Germain. Then it'll be Southampton next week, and, th and then he'll get round to thinking about it. But um, it'll be a brilliant game. It'll potentially, um, I won't say decisive, but it's going it, to be a fascinating game and kind of evoking memories of how it was in 2005 um, when the, the rivalry really burst, uh, burst from that with, with Rafa and um, Jose Mourinho. But can I take you on a trip down memory lane? Of course, if I can. can. Go on. Which, which was the best? of those games, which was the most intense... Second leg of the first semi-final in 2005. This is the ghost goal. It went across the line, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> across, the line. <laughs> across the line? Across the line? I know a man who says very, very different. Well, yeah, yeah, but you do. But, um, no, that night, I've never, never... I don't think I'll ever see Anfield like that again. Passion, noise, the intensity, yeah, fervor. The intensity. It, it actually felt like the stadium was shaking at times. It was like nothing I've ever experienced. Really? Mm. I'm not sure Chelsea's defence at the moment are ready for Liverpool. They've, they've, even in this, this winning run, they've looked fragile at the back. Um, they haven't got it quite sorted. They've moved from a, a, a five or a three mm. to, to the traditional back four. David Luiz has come back in and, and looked shaky. Um, they haven't properly been... They've played against teams that they can just outscore so far. But I, I'd be 
very worried about that defence against Liverpool. They suffered a little against Arsenal. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't think we've ever previewed a fixture in the Premier League about three weeks before it's about to be played. But I think when we talk about the two teams being on collision course and being at the same point yes. now, that's where the big difference for me is. Liverpool yeah. have sorted out their defence. Yeah. I think Chelsea are quite a long way from sorting yeah. out their defence. OK, Manchester City, they are hovering. Um, another win for them, of course, yesterday against uh, Fulham, Natalie. Um, Shane Mansour wrote to the supporters yesterday, uh, it's 10 years, he's predicting another 10 years of success and promising uh, 10 more years of uh, another sort of fantasy journey um, in charge and that they want to deliver more trophies. Um, what have you made of the last 10 years and what do you predict will happen with Manchester City under, under that ownership structure? Yeah, I think it's interesting how he acted in different areas in uh, women's team, in uh, young's, young's team, so, uh, and structure-wise, it's uh, unbelievable what they have done. And, you know, when I first moved to England, I was very impressed with uh, the spirit that surrounds City, because when, when you're away, you have this impression of, oh, there's another club that has money, you know, and there's so much more, and you talk to the fans, and they, they, they are getting used to the fact that they win now, yeah. and they're, they're against United in, in that match that they could have won the title. They were all, oh, uh, we're just waiting to see everything falls, falls up, falling apart, you know. But uh, that's, I think that's the most impressive thing for Their me. first signing was Robinho, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Yes, it was. Yeah. What's yeah, happened to him? What's he doing? <sighs> What is he doing? I'm going to Google it for you. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll Google it. I'm not sure. What, I'm yeah. sure I saw an interview with uh, Rubinho the other day. Um, but it is, when, when you said you were, when you were in Brazil and yeah. before the, the, the money came into Manchester City, what, what was your impressions of Manchester City? Because whenever we used to speak, in the past, before Manchester City started winning titles, on the continent, people would always refer to Manchester as mm -hmm. Manchester United. Yes. But now, of course, we have to separate them between Manchester United and Manchester yes. City. There's another club in town here, yes. and they want to win trophies. But, but back in Brazil, what was your awareness of, of Manchester City as a club? No awareness, honestly. Uh, Manchester City went through a huge international internationalization process, and now people are more and more aware of them, and they. Uh, you have fans, uh, city fans in Brazil, but uh, when they they started, when they bought Robinho and even Tevez and like other players, people were like, "But is Manchester?" Until these days, people call United Manchester yeah. in Brazil. There's there's a bit of a struggle still, but it's impressive what they've done in, in internationally wise. Yeah. yeah, the wonders of modern technology. We've discovered that Robinho is now playing in uh, in Turkey. That's where he is, Tivisville, reviving his career. Yeah. <laughs> I just think it's, it's amazing. How the, <clears throat> I started working at the Manchester Evening News 20 years ago, um, and one of the first jobs I did was going over to Platt Lane, and they were trying to get a story in the paper about... You're not here to write your autobiography. No, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a sort of... They were, they were getting a story in the paper about um, getting new AstroTurf for Pla uh, the pitches in Platt Lane, which was the, the old training centre, and they were in League One. And you know they had games at York and whatever, and then and to see where they are now with the players that they've got and whatever, it's just been a an incredible journey. Yeah, more of the same. Um, are they as motivated and as hungry as they were last season to win the title? That's what we've got to see, isn't it? I mean, that that is why so few teams managed to defend defend the title. I think United are the the last team still to do it some time ago, and. There's been a lot of times where you look at these teams and these clubs and you just think, how are they not going to dominate? How are they not going to just keep winning title after title? And yet, the defending the title has been proved to be the hardest thing. And I think it is, if there is even that sort of 2 3% drop-off in, in motivation on it, um, someone else will, will come along and, and have the motivation. And, you know, there, w there won't be a more motivated club than Liverpool to try and take it off them this season is their motivation as well to try and win the Champions League. I, I think Pep Guardiola would tell you that the Premier League is, is still the biggest thing for him. I think for Manchester City fans, the Premier League is definitely the still biggest thing. But those players, that group of international players, would they now prefer to win a Champions League? And 
that is going to be what we see over the next few months. Yeah, it'd be great to see David Silva, for example, scored yesterday for City. Been such an influential player over 300 appearances that it'd be great to see him towards the end of his career go and win it with Manchester City. Maybe they can do it um, this season. OK, next up we're going to talk um, international football, talk England, we'll talk Brazil, we'll talk this man as well, Wayne Rooney. He wants to be a manager. More him next. Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement with us this morning, uh, Matt Law, Natalie Jedra and Dominic King. Let's have a look and remind you of the papers this morning, Sunday Express, uh, ready to rumble. Uh, Liverpool, good win for them, big win yesterday at Wembley Stadium against Tottenham, 2-1, five wins in a row. Man on Sunday, Oliver Holt, he was at Wembley yesterday, he's also been out to see Wayne Rooney, he wants to be the boss, he wants to be a manager at the end of his career. We're coming on to him shortly, but more on that game at Wembley yesterday, good headline here in the Sun, goals pull out, Vorm is temporary, mistake by the Tottenham keeper yesterday, but class is permanent, whereas Hugo Lloris, when they need him, when they needed him, he's injured to the back of the sun. Hazard warning, can he really get 40 goals? He got a hat-trick yesterday in Chelsea's 4-1 victory over Cardiff. Daniel Taylor's column in the Observer coming on to this man, Marco Silva in part five. Um, was he really tapped up by Everton? He was, of course, the Watford manager until he was sacked last season. Sam Wallace's column, Pellegrini, he's on shaky ground at West Ham. They could do with a win. They play Everton later today. That's Sam's column. And uh, the Sunday Mirror with the transfer story, Juventus star uh, Paolo Dybala um, on his way out. He's going to be swapped for Paul Pogba, according to Simon Mullock, this morning on the back of the Sunday Mirror. But we should uh, talk international football now. Um, England's performance... Um, against Spain uh, was a lesson in keep ball uh, the previous week um, on last Saturday. Mm. And then, of course, the Switzerland game, um, which we haven't had chance. It's the first chance we've had to discuss it. But what were your thoughts on intensity, purpose of the fixture, the opposition, and the way that England played at uh, the King Power? <coughs> um, well, I mean, it was... <laughs> It was an exercise. In the, they had to fulfil two fixtures, didn't they? Mm -hmm. um, with the two competitive ones next year. Uh, certainly next month. Yeah. Um, big changes. It was a chance for people to step up. Um, first half. Have? First half wasn't so great. I'm not sure if some of them did. But I think it was probably a fixture that everybody could have done without. Mm. You watched, the 20, you watched the 21s as well, didn't you? Mm. Um, the, I was in Lafayette. Yeah. Yes, the previous night. Can any of those players make a difference or are any of them ready to play for the senior side? Um, well, Chilwell, Chilwell's come up and yes. uh, he'll, 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 be, he'll be playing for England soon. Two good years. Enough. Yeah, he's top draw. Mm. He's a really good player. Um, I'm not putting pressure on, on him because he's a young lad and he's got a lot of development to do, but what I've seen over my, of Mason Mount this season, uh, particularly on Tuesday night in Latvia, um, he looks like he's got something a bit different about him, something that he could, you could see him playing at a higher level. Um, balance, poise, f fights, a uh, bit of tenacity about him. Um, he looks like he could, he could graduate in years to come. He's only 19. That's not, you know, say he's, he's, he's the second coming, but he's a very, very promising player. You do have to listen to Dominic King, though, when he's talking about international football, because one of the last times you're on this programme, so, you said Jordan Pickford would be England's number one at the World Cup. Yeah, and you, you looked at me like I had... Well, I think you well, conceded yeah. about 70 <laughs> goals for Sutton at that point. I did think you were a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy, but you were absolutely spot on. Well, well England, he's, England knew that he's, he's going to... You can be, take a bit of credit no, from no. It's, a, it's a big pound no. on the back. Come on, take the credit. But I'll, I'll, I'll take the credit from you. I'll, 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 I'll take it as an apology for calling me uh, the wrong name to start off with. Well. Oh, it's brutal. You've levelled the scores up with that, haven't you? Um, Marcus Rashford scored yeah. against Spain, scored against Switzerland. Um, but his Mourinho, of course, talked on Friday at length over four minutes of statistics about how many minutes he's played, how he's had a chance at Manchester United. He's not, Rashford isn't in a position of strength this weekend because he just started serving a three-match ban um, for his uh, sending off at Burnley in his last Premier League fixture. But um, this eternal debate seems to be when is Rashford going to convert this immense promise into serious pedigree as a footballer? I think he is. I mean, I think he is. You know, fulfilling his, he's in the midst of fulfilling his potential. He's 20 years old. There's, yeah. as, as Mourinho is at pains to point out, there's not many 20 year old footballers playing any part for big clubs, mm. um, let alone a fairly major part, and for also for their international teams. 
I think he's he's doing what he should well, he's not doing what he should be doing. He's doing more than he should be doing for a 20-year-old. I think he's overachieving. I think he's doing really well. I'm, I'm actually kind of with Mourinho on this, on his stats, that he's, he's getting chances at United. He's playing at United. Lots of, lots of English kids younger than him and a bit older than him aren't playing at all at their clubs. He's getting enough minutes. Um, I think he's in a good place. I don't understand why people think he should leave Manchester United. I don't get that at all. I think it's a great place for him. It's, it's where he's from. It's where he's developed. They're invested in him. I don't quite get that debate on Rashford. Mm. I don't quite get why, why people are making an issue of it. I think, actually, Oli Kay wrote a great piece yesterday. I think there's a much bigger debate to have on someone like Dom Solanke or even Ruben Loftus cheek mm. but not Rashford. He's, he's playing for club and country. Mm. We I want think... him to be a superstar in Italy, and you'll have seen it so many times before with players in Brazil. Is there that kind of intensity and that kind of um, excitement that's generated around young players as soon as they make the breakthrough into yeah. the first team? Do, we, do, you, do you guys see it all the time with different clubs? All the time. There's this anxiety of uh, watching this player develop, but it's really different because in Brazil, usually uh, the, player is, the player is in Brazil. So once he moves to Europe, we know he's going to get on the back of the line. We saw it with Casemiro when he moved to Real Madrid. He was already big in Brazil and then he moved with Real Madrid and he played for Real Madrid B for one mm -hmm. or two seasons and we're seeing now with another young player Vinicius Junior who was at Real Madrid as well. So there's an order for these things. The price you pay for playing uh, in such a big club. How, how, do, how do the natives, how do Brazilians feel when their latest superstar, young superstar, is spirited away from the country to go and play on the continent with, whether that's Real Madrid, whether that's at Barcelona, whether it's a club in Portugal, mm -hmm. that, that traditional move, or into Italy as well, of course. How do Brazilians feel about those players being spirited away? Well, it's sad, but we're kind of used to it because that's the natural course of things, you know. Uh, every player, when he's... And it's open, they, they talk about it. They say that their, their goal is to play in Europe and nobody's going to take that away from, from them. Uh, in Gabriel Jesus' uh, example, uh, he actually waited until the Brazilian calendar was over because he wanted to be champion in Brazil. So that was nice, that was an exception. Because usually there's the transfer window in the summer, and it's in, right in the middle of the Brazilian season. Brazilian calendar is bizarre. So, so they, yeah. they lose a lot of players uh, during July. In, right in the middle of the season. So what Gabriel did was highly praised for, from fans and from the media. But, yeah, it's, it's the sense of, yeah, it's going to happen. It's about to happen. You know? it, what's the most prestigious competition to win? What's the most prestigious? Is it state championship, league, Copa Libertadores? Libertadores, yes, yes. It's the equivalent of Champions League uh, in South America. It's a very peculiar competition because... Uh, the logistics are complicated. Uh, you play on the altitude. Uh, the characteristics of the teams, they are very... Th there's a lot of struggle. Uh, there's the atmosphere of the fans. The, it's hostile. So there are a lot of things to overcome to mm -hmm. win Libertadores. The ultimate so a, test. Yes, it's a very big thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of England's um, next matches, uh, which, of course, come up, Mm -hmm. Next month, Croatia, um, which will be behind closed doors because mm -hmm. of their own supporters can't keep, um, can't behave themselves, and also the fixture in Spain. What does Gareth Southgate look to do? Look to do in those fixtures? Well, uh, is it worked out that England can't qualify? Well, mm, not yet. How, how, does, how does it work? Well, if they, well, if they, there's three teams in the Nations League, and if they beat Croatia and beat Spain, if yeah. beat Croatia over two legs and beat Spain, then they'll potentially win the group, won't they? Yeah. Um, I still we'll be in the Nations League final next summer. Yeah, That'd be yeah. something to get excited um, about. I think it's just. He, I think he just has to look at it as another um, building block towards Euro 2020 and try and improve on, learn the lessons that they they were taught last week by by Spain. Um, try and get closer to them. Try and settle the score with Croatia from the summer uh, and move on. Sam, um, Sam Wallace Matt, said uh, he made a point. I think it was on Twitter during during the game that. Well, we can kind of accept not having the ball mm. against Spain at Wembley. It's not ideal and we don't like it, we don't enjoy it in our own backyard and it's not pleasant. 
But it's a bit different when Switzerland doing. Yeah, I mean, it was, even though okay, I accept England won the fixture, but at times it was keep ball for Switzerland. And, rounded side. Yeah, I mean, we said it's keep ball for Spain. It's keep ball for Switzerland in the first half, and Shakiri, who's obviously on on the bench for Liverpool, ran the game. I mean, it was striking in the first half that he was by far the best midfielder on the pitch, um, which was a little bit concerning. Um, yeah, it didn't didn't fill me with confidence that those two games, to be quite honest with you. And we've got to hope that maybe Croatia is still switched off after, well, after their battered, World Cup. Yeah. They got battered by Spain. But I think, I mean, it, it doesn't really matter whether or not we win that group, but you don't want to lose it and get relegated because then the following summer you, you play in less presti prestigious games, um, which won't be seen as good for our development. So they'll be very, very determined not to finish bottom of the group. Yeah. If it's any consolation, Brazil had a tie with Switzerland in the <laughs> opening match yeah. of the World Cup. Yeah. It was a very tough game, yeah. And you've, you've just been to see the national team um, yes, out, in in, the US. out in America on their, on their uh, latest leg of their, um, of their world tour. Uh, Post-World Cup, what's the mood and what is the, is there... Has there been many changes to the squad and, and the ideas around that squad? Yeah, well, Br Brazil had two matches against the United States and El Salvador. It was highly criticized, actually, because you were always expecting Brazil to face big opponents, not El Salvador, number 72 in FIFA ranking. But uh, 12 of the 23 players who were involved in these matches weren't at the World Cup. TT is doing... Uh, a lot of observations in this uh, in September, October and November because he wants to create a base for the matches in March uh, to Copa America. Mm -hmm. We have Copa America in, in June. And the idea and the speech among all the players is that the bases are there. The work that has been done for the World Cup was really good and now they have to, to keep going from that base. So it's not, it's, it's not the feeling of big change. Uh, Chichi is going to uh, give opportunity to younger players. Uh, there are some positions where we have uh, players that are aging, especially defensive, uh, mm -hmm. especially in defense. But uh, there's this sense of continuity, you know, that, that the work has been done. Chichi was kept. Uh, he has a new contract for the next four years and uh, they, they just want to start from there. And actually the, the Brazilians were proud of how the team performed at the World Cup. If you see the, the match against Belgium, was considering the, the the last World Cup, the last game there. Yes, yes. Well, sorry you, to you, you, ha you have to come back to this. To that. Well, if you see uh, Brazil and Belgium, was a, one of the best matches in the World Cup. Was very good, very exciting, lots of opportunities, and they they couldn't digest uh, losing to Belgium so well because they played well and they felt the preparation was, was really good. Is, is there still a mystique about the national team or is it seen as a, a rampant commercial entity now? During the World Cup, you feel the mystique. Yeah. You do. But uh, until you get to the World Cup, there's a lot of criticism and there's a lot of expectations and everything is crucial. It's, it's, analyzed and you know all the choices that uh, Titi does recently he was very criticized for putting Neymar as as captain mm -hmm. now so everything's really analyzed but now we're in that phase uh, actually the Brazilians are patching up with their national team yeah it's a, yeah, it's a process it's, a, it's, an, it's an ongoing process yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay well, we're going to talk about Neymar next you never thought you'd hear him in the same sentence as uh, Wilfred Zaha but you just did, we'll tell you why. That's uh, coming next, Neymar and Wilfried Zaha. Welcome back to the Sunday Supplement. Uh, Goals on Sunday, of course, follows us next up. Let's find out what Ben and Cameron are up to, Ben. Morning, Neil. A very busy show as ever coming up, haven't we, Kemi? Good morning. We have indeed, yes. Yeah, Azamir Begovic is going to be joining us it in the studio. Would you believe I had breakfast with him yesterday, watched his game yesterday afternoon, and he's with me again today. He's stalking you, Cam. What's going on? But a great result for Bournemouth and plenty of other uh, incidents that we'll be talking about on Goals on Sunday. So we'll see everybody bright and early, 11 o'clock. Certainly will. Uh, ben and Cammy with Goals on Sunday. That follows us, of course, on the supplement. Um, let's talk uh, Wilfred Zaha now. Um, Scored yesterday, belting goal for Crystal Palace to win the game up at Huddersfield. But his post-match interviews were fascinating, man, mm -hmm. because rarely do we hear a Premier League footballer, certainly with his standing, his influence and his importance 
an attachment to, Chris, to this team in particular, talking the way that he did so openly about the way that he feels that referees are not protecting him, that opposition players are not punished. And the words that he used, to, the words that he used were, it feels as though somebody has got to break my legs mm. before I start getting some protection. Um, does, the language of course is colourful, but does he have a point? Oof, it's a difficult debate because he has been guilty mm. of, of diving, basically, in the past. You're not going to like me for saying this. Um, <laughs> but he's, he's rightly or wrongly or fairly unfairly, he's developed a reputation as, as someone who will go down too easily. And it has now crossed over to the line where I think it does work against him. I think he does get fouled. I do think he gets rough treatment. And he probably doesn't get the protection that he deserves. And part of that will be because of his, his reputation, mm. I think. Is, um, is he being... Let's, let's, the but, brutal reality is that he is very obviously Crystal Palace's this is, best outfield player by a mile. This is the problem. I mean, So, if you want to stop Crystal Palace, have a nibble at Zaha. This is exactly what I was going to say. I've, I've, I was speaking to you off air. I, I can't remember a Premier League team who's been so reliant on, on one player. Chelsea. I mean, it's, Hazard. They can win without Hazard, though. They won at the start of the season. Crystal Palace can't pick up a point without Wilfred Zaha. <laughs> I mean, I've never known anything quite like it, and therefore teams and defenders are clearly going to think, stop Wilfred Zaha, stop Crystal Palace. And if you injure Wilfred Zaha, Palace are probably, you know, re relegation candidates. Mm -hmm. So that will, that will definitely come into it, but I, I definitely have some sympathy with him, mm -hmm. that he needs, his type of player mm -hmm. needs protecting, because he will go into games and some opposition tactics will be to just kick him to keep him out of the game. His, his type of player, I mean, that we, do, we, do we make an exception for, oh, look, he's a winger, he's a forward player, so, yeah, they're, ask, they're asking for trouble. He's quick, he's pacey, he's very direct at times. No. Is, he, is he asking for trouble and therefore must get treated differently by referees? Or no, do, I, should all players be treated exa in exactly the same way? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can see where he's coming from because the, the incident with him, with, with Kapu. That was just mm. despicable. The picture of it is horrendous. He could have been out for the, he could have been out for the season. And if that's being festering in his mind, you know that, he, that picture was on the on the front of our um, verdict on the Monday. It was just awful. Like the, the studs on the back of the Achilles. Mm. Oh. Um, and from what I've heard of him, you you tell me better. But the people I know who've worked with him at Palace said he's one of the most honest, um, committed. He'll play through. Injuries. He just wants to get out there and play. Um, really, at this attitude that he, ju he just wants to be out there. And if he feels that he's being targeted and kicked to pieces, then I can. It'll be where, yeah, he's, yeah, he's the best player, and yes, he is a target. But it will, it will eventually come a point where it, you know it's, it's wearing on him, and it's, his frustrations have obviously bubbled over in that interview yesterday. But now, I do have sympathy. Really do. It, it bubbled over in a game that he'd just won for Crystal Palace. Yeah. That was that's what I found the most remarkable thing. That normally players just okay, scored a great goal, take take the adulation, accept it, and move on to the next game. But he didn't. He said, "Actually, no, mm. I've got something to say." Yeah, um, and in some ways, it's better that he said it after a game where he's he's made a contribution like that, because if if he says yeah. it after a game in which he hasn't got a penalty or something and Palace have lost, then it sounds like it's it's sour grapes. But he said that from a a point of authority, you know, yeah. I've taken that off soon. Mm. Harry the Hornet doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Harry well, the Hornet's quit, I think. He has, yeah. he has quit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He big has news. Big news of the week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what, um, what does Zaha need some protection here? Or players of his... Uh, let's not just restrict it to Zaha, let's open up. To players of his ilk, with his ability, the players that we enjoy seeing, the entertainers, yeah. the players that we go to watch football to, to see something do magical something different to change a game to, ma to win a match do they need more protection i think so and uh we've heard the speech last season from pep guardiola after i think a, a league cup match uh when sané got injured and uh but on the other hand we always talk to to players who come from different parts of the world and they always say that the Premier League is very physical and that's what makes it so attractive and that's why they like to play. So there's there's a line mm -hmm. to be drawn, but there's this to take into consideration. It's a physical league, 
but you do have to protect the players because there's there's a boundary there. Yeah. yeah. What about another player of that ilk, that kind of quality and okay, he's that kind of quality. <laughs> Neymar's, got, <laughs> Neymar's got a bit of Wilfred Zaha's quality. What's that then? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you want to say. No, 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 no. I, um, you want to say that, don't you? Well, Neymar. I mean, Neymar does for sure dive and roll. But, but he, and the, the point I was making was that he's a. There are players that get you off your seat. That you have that enthusiasm, that yeah. raw emotion when you see them play. You think they're about to do something different. Well, that's yeah. Zaha for Palace. Okay, let's isolate Neymar. He plays for Paris Saint Germain in Brazil. But he's had criticism. Dani Alves spoke this week, didn't he, and said I've had to have a chat with him. But is he a diver? There's something that we have to put into context in Brazil. Being a diver, sometimes it's, it's, it's praised. People actually demand this from some players. Why did you try to dive, you know, try, try to, to get the fall? And so that's a cultural thing. But even the Brazilians are annoyed by that, by, by the, not so much by the diving, but by the, don't roll over, you know, that's, that's what I heard so many times. Okay, you get the fall. We all know that Neymar gets fouled. Of course, he's been fouled his whole career, and he learned to, to respond well, especially in Barcelona. He, 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 he wasn't like that. And, and now, I think that the thing that annoys people the most is the theatrical part, mm -hmm. and he's paying for that already, because against El Salvador, he had, a, he had the contact with the defender, he went down because of the contact, but he got booked for diving. And he was very annoyed after the match uh, because the, the, the referee booked him and, gave, and smiled. Like, yeah. and, and in the previous match against the United States, uh, he got fouled and the, the, the American defender was like, did you see the World Cup? You could read his lips. Yes. Uh, did you see the World Cup to the referee? So he's going to pay for it. He's already paying for it. Mm. And Brazilians are... are frustrated in this sense. What, sorry, one of the reasons that I think everyone respects Lionel Messi so much, yes. is apart from his talent, is I can't remember, I'm sure Just someone out there it. will tell me that he's dived, but I can't remember ever seeing him dive and he gets kicked to pieces, never complains, just gets up, keeps going. And okay, not everyone has to be like that, but it, it shows people will really respect you if you do that. And apart from his talent, people love Messi because of that, I think. Yeah. OK, we've just named uh, three world superstars, uh, Messi, Neymar, Zaha. Uh, let's name a fourth, Wayne Rooney. Back page of the Mail on Sunday this morning, uh, Sunday Times as well, we should say. Mm. have also interviewed Wayne Rooney out mm. in uh, Washington, where he's um, enjoying his new career. Um, there's no question about that. But in this interview, Oliver Holt, Jonathan Northcott, he says he wants to be a manager. Mm. Um, he wants to follow in the footsteps of Stephen Gerrard, of course, at Rangers, Frank Lampard. Um, at, at Derby, Lampard sends off yesterday, but will Rooney, is Rooney management material? Um, I don't doubt his desire to do it. Um, um, I know how seriously he's taking it, he's doing his badges and um, football's all he's known, football's his life um, and if he wants to prolong his career, or then yeah, um, he's certainly got the um, Presence, he has got presence, you, you know, from, from dealing with him at England. His, his achievements speak for themselves, so he'd command the respect of players. Um, if he wants to have a go at it, well, you know, good luck to him. Mm. How long do you expect him to continue playing for? You saw him towards yeah. the end at Everton, not, not towards the end of his career, but towards the end mm. of his Everton career last season. But do you suggest, are there any signs to suggest that this is, that he's coming to the end, or is he the no. kind of player who? He's, he loves the ball at his feet, he will continue, he wants to play on. Well, he signed three and a half years in America. Um, I could see him doing that full contract. Um, he loves it there. He loves the anonymity of life that he's got. He can go to Starbucks and just be on his own and he can go out with the kids and have a walk around with them and not get hassled. Um, and I think that's been quite refreshing for someone who's, who's you know, looked at his mates going, going out, and he's never been able to do that, um, and not without being pestered or people looking at what he's doing. Um, so I think he, he loves that that side of life. Um, there's a sort of thing about um, Everton as well. Last year, he was nowhere near as bad as as, as 
some people have tried to sort of portray towards the end. He didn't play well under Sam Allardyce um, the last couple of months, but he was the reason Everton had something to cling on to um, before Christmas when he scored his goals. He provided all the best moments. The goal against West Ham, the equaliser against Liverpool at Anfield, the, um, the goal on his debut, mm -hmm. goal against Man City. He was, he was good. He was good for Everton. Is, is there a tinge of regret and sadness about the way that he left among Evertonians? Yeah, yeah. It, I just... I, I, this isn't the way it was meant to be. It was meant to be no, a fairy tale. No, no, no. It, it, it's a shame. Um, some, some, I think, were ambivalent towards him going and sort of shrugged the shoulders and said, well, you know, he hadn't, <coughs> he hadn't done it towards the end of last season. Um, I just thought, looking at it, I mean, you, you just said that he's a global name. Mm. And if you're trying to sell Everton around the world and you've got Wayne Rooney there, why, why, do, you not, why do you not keep him around the place? You don't have to use him all the time in every game. But you can, you can see he's in that league. He's miles above anything around him. Mm. You know, he, could he could he play like at United or anything like that? Probably not anymore. But he's he's still he's still he's still a class player. Yeah, he's still a he, class actually. Yeah. Okay, good stuff, guys. Okay, um, next up we're going to talk uh, Marco Silva, the new Everton manager. Uh, did he break the rules? Did Everton break the rules um, when they tapped or when they? accused of being tapping him up last season when he was the Watford manager. More on him next. Um, let's talk Daniel Taylor's column, shall we? Yeah. Um, if tapper uppers won't change their ways, uh, the penalty must be uh, deducting points in the Premier League. That's uh, Danny's column this morning. Um, there's a sort of potted history of a number of cases down the years mm. where clubs, managers, players have been tapped up, and some interesting um, yeah. stories from the past. But the current one, of course, which is uh, which is with, with Daniel's dealing with in his column today, is Marco Silva. The case, the curious case of Marco Silva, because Everton eventually got their man, mm. and they did get him as their manager, but. Did they tap him up? Uh, let's just say that um, he was the manager that Farhad Mashiri wanted to succeed, Ronald Koeman. Mm -hmm. There was an approach that Watford rebuffed. Um, then he ended up leaving, as we know, and he's ended up at Everton um, 11 months later. and. To put it in a nutshell, they, they can't uh, agree compensation. The clubs have tried, um, but I'm, I'm not going to say whether any, anyone's been tapped up. But well, look, does does it matter that managers, players are routinely asked, "Are you up for this? Do you fancy it? If it happens, if this job becomes available, would you be interested?" That that is the equivalent. That's what we're talking about here. Well, we're, we're assuming that football is the only industry that it happens in. It must happen in. Commerce and business and whatever it must go on. If if someone's doing well at one company and another company wants them, there must be some you know things that go on like that. Um, it's gone on for years. As as Danny's columns great and pulls uh, a number of great, uh, illuminating stories out. It, it's gone on for years and it's never going to change. Yeah, I don't. My think favourite is the Joe Cole story, which Danny says that um, according to uh, legend. Um, Sir Alex Ferguson sent Joe Cole the number 10 shirt when he was at West Ham's Academy and said, this will be your shirt when you join Manchester United. We don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but uh, that story is in Danny's column this morning. It, it, is, is the culture in English football, of course, everybody wants to be seen to be doing the right thing, always publicly, that there was an official approach from Everton last season for Watford. They turned it down. They had to wait for their man. In Brazil, does anybody care about that stuff? Not as much as, as here, <laughs> no, definitely not, yeah. And you see managers moving around all the time. If you Even want Scalari, much. you can have him. Yes, yeah. exactly. Take you, him. If you want Scalari, definitely take him. <laughs> yes, that, take him. <laughs> no, but, but even, it, it's, it's actually too much because if you see, we were talking about that, if you see uh, the, the, yeah. the history of the, the Brazilian managers, they, they work all over the Natalie, place. Yeah, so you go yeah? to Wikipedia, it just, yeah, it, honestly, it's, it's just like that. Yeah. Yes, The yes. clubs that they've managed. That's why I'm always so impressed whenever I see a big idol, we were talking about Rooney, uh, turning into manager. That doesn't happen with the Brazilians because they know they're going to get hammered and they, they are afraid to stain their history, uh, yeah. everything that they built in football, yeah. they're afraid to stain because it, it, it's a tough market. Yeah. yeah. Can we see Ronald Gina's um, 
as a manager? <laughs> no, no, not I really. So. No, definitely not. How will this be resolved, Matt? I suspect with a fine. I mean, if they, if they were to do a points deduction, it would open up an mm. absolute hornet's nest. I mean, clubs have been fined. Nest. Plenty. <laughs> there you Very go. Yeah. Good. Um, didn't even know, did it? I didn't even realise. Um, but no, I mean, clubs, clubs have been fined plenty of times mm. for allegedly tapping up or breaking the rules. But points deduction, I think, would, would encourage a lot of people to point fingers in lots of different directions. I mean, Watford would have to be very confident that, that they had never spoken to any players or managers before actually appointing them. I can't see the Premier League wanting to, to open that up particularly. I mean, I've got to say, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by Watford's stance, just in that I think most football clubs and most chief executives and chairmen just accept that it just yeah. happens, it's just part of it. And if someone's doing it to you one time, you're going to be ended up... Yeah. It goes down the food chain. You know, if a top four club's doing it to a mid-ranking Premier League club, then the mid-ranking Premier League club's doing it to a bottom and they're doing it to a championship club. And mm. it all just filters down the food chain. And I think, generally, most people are sort of adult enough to accept that. This, this does feel like a personal grudge with yeah. the whole Watford and, and Silver mm. thing. And it feels like they want to punish him as much as they want to punish Everton. Mm -hmm. Didn't, didn't stop them signing Richarlison though, did it? Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that, they, they managed to negotiate, um, they, they managed to negotiate his, uh, his, his sale. Um, yeah, and Richarlison really likes Marco Silva, so that was definitely um, Yeah, an And they would have never have spoken at all. Absolutely not, yeah. no. Making his mark with Brazil as well? Yes, yes. He did really well in the two friendly matches. He scored twice. He shows a lot of character, a lot of personality, but the, the big question mark again, uh, regarding Richarlison is uh, if he's going to maintain it. Mm. For, at Everton, uh, at Watford he didn't, at Everton now, and in the Brazilian squad, uh, if he's going to maintain this high level mm. of performance, yeah. Yeah, he, st he started well. He's, um, the fans have taken to him straight away, so he just, uh, we've seen what he, uh, he, he started well at Watford. We need to see whether he'll uh, sustain it. Yeah, yeah, he's very talented, yeah. Very talented. A uh, quick word on, um, on Pellegrini, because that's Everton's opponents today. Um, if he loses today, heat on, pressure on? I don't think he's in danger of getting the sack. Okay. I don't think they're quick sackers. I, I, I certainly would, would think that he's got till the new year. Mm. I mean, they famously let Avram Grant <laughs> sleepwalk into relegation. I can't see them doing that again, but I don't think he'd be in danger of the sack, but it's, it's a real must, must not lose mm. for West Ham. Yeah, it feels like that, doesn't it? OK. Um, thanks very much. We've run out of time. Um, it's a Sunday supplement first today. Two croissants on every si or two pastries on every single guest's uh, plates. I don't want them eaten. What's going on? Athletes. Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Um, Matt Law, Natalie Jedra and Dom King.